welcome to our second International Press Roundtable this year. This uh, time we are covering Germany's reaction to the war between Israel and the Hamas. I'm Stormy Miltner, I'm the director of the Aspen Institute um, and I am your host today. And with this, I also invite um, our panelists to uh, join me on, this, on the virtual stage um, to activate their cameras and come on in. Over the past months, the eyes um, of the world have been on Israel and Palestine with uh, major news and media agencies providing live reports and analysis of the war. And we all have uh, deep empathy and uh, feeling for all the civilians um, in the region who experience uh, tremendous uh, sufferings. And um, our heart really goes um, out to um, all of them, to their relatives and also um, to their friends. Um, today, we want to take a closer look at uh, the German perspective um, on the war. So we want to ask uh, several questions and hopefully also to find uh, good answers on which role does the German government uh, adopt on the European and international level towards the war? Um, how is Germany dealing with the escalation in the Middle East? Um, also in comparison uh, to other countries. Um, and that's why I'm so happy that we have different country perspective, um, perspectives with us today. We want to look at what um, trends and tendencies and also distortions um, in German society are emerging as a result of the war and how we should deal with them. And um, certainly we also want to take a closer look at the role of media. Um, what, what, what could media help to reduce populism and disinformation in our societies? Um, what, uh, what positive role can media play? But also what are you observing with regard to maybe some troublesome uh, developments um, in the media landscape? And uh, to discuss these and other questions, we invited four journalists from different countries who report about Germany or Israel and uh, the Palestinian territories and who can share their assessment of uh, Germany's relation to the ongoing war in Israel and uh, Gaza. And with this, it's a great, great pleasure um, to welcome old and new friends um, to our press roundtable um, this early um, this morning. Um, so first of all, let me introduce uh, Stephen Erlanger to you. Stephen is chief diplomatic correspondent um, in Europe for uh, the New York Times. And uh, he has worked for the New York Times since uh, 1987. Um, initially, uh, and that is something I also didn't know, um, as a Metro reporter. Um, and from 2004 to 2008, um, he acted as bureau chief in Jerusalem. And he's currently based in Berlin um, and also reports intensely um, on the war and uh, Currently, Stephen um, is in Jerusalem. So thank you so much, uh, Stephen, for joining us uh, today. Sophie von der Tan is ARD correspondent for Israel and the Palestinian territories. Um, she has worked for the ARD since uh, 2018, um, initially as a host and presenter for the news uh, WG format of BR, <laughs> and then as a correspondent for the ID Hauptstadt Studio and as, as a podcast host. And uh, Sophie has all, um, also joined us in our podcast, America's Choice, in the past when we talked about US issues. Sophie um, von der Tan has a degree in theology and oriental studies from Oxford University and a degree in international and world history from the London School of Economics, which we share, um, and Columbia University. And uh, you, Sophie, are currently based um, in Tel Aviv. Sam Jones is the Financial Times correspondent in Berlin, um, and he covers German foreign and defense security policy not just for um, Germany, but also for Austria um, and Switzerland. And uh, Sam, you have been working for the Financial Times since 2007, taking on different positions, um, including the FT's International Defense and Security Editor, um, and also being on the newspaper's investigation team. Thank you so much, uh, Sam, for joining us today. Thank you. 
And uh, last but not least, um, also um, a very warm welcome to P Pascal Thibault, who is the Radio France um, International Correspondent um, in Berlin. Um, you really know Berlin inside out and outside in. Um, <laughs> you have um, been working here um, as a correspondent uh, since the 1990s. You covered um, already the reunification. And um, I think you are one of the um, Deutschland Versteher, the German understanders um, who have uh, covered us um, intensely. And I'm very, very happy that um, you are with us um, here today. And I would like um, to, we usually start out um, our round of discussions with one question, which I pose to all of our participants. Um, so we know and we heard and we see every morning, every um, throughout the whole day, a lot of media coverage um, on, on the war. And um, what I wanted to ask you and to kick us off with is your um, evaluation of how objective um, this reporting is. Um, you, I thought about asking you about a scale on, um, on the objectivity level from one to 10, with 10 being very objective and one not so objective, but that might be a little tricky. So you can also put it in words, um, how you feel about the current reporting um, on, on the war. And uh, maybe um, I may start with you, Sophie. How do you feel about the reporting in general? Yeah, I don't think it's for me to judge how objective reporting <laughs> in total uh, of this war is. I don't even think I have the total overview of everything that's being reported on. Um, sure, there are different viewpoints um, and different emphases that different countries or pr perspectives take. Um, we're trying, I can only say for myself, I'm trying to take a big effort at making this as objective as possible. But there are... Um, there are challenges we're facing and the biggest one right now is that we can't get into Gaza ourselves mm -hmm. and we cannot see with our own eyes what's going on and I believe as a journalist that's always the best if I can actually have my own impression um, of the situation on the ground so we rely on our team in Gaza and they uh, help us a lot. Their job is incredibly important and dangerous at the moment. They were at the border to, uh, with Rafah and could confirm once the first um, aid convoys uh, were reaching Gaza, but they also can't go to many places uh, because of the situation right now. And then we're faced with information that we cannot independently verify. And that's a problem you often have when reporting from a war, um, that you get information from the warring parties as well, and you cannot independently verify them. So there are challenges as well that we face when reporting on this war. Thank you very much um, for also already hi highlighting um, the problems. If I may ask you a follow-up question, Sophie, um, if you can um, verify sources or information, how do you deal with this? Um, do you make your readers, viewers um, aware of this? Well, we try as best as we can. For instance, with regard to Shifa Hospital, we had a contact to some to a doctor in the Shifa Hospital who we were in close contact with, who could describe the situation on the ground for us. Uh, however, he at some point also left the hospital, so we we lost that connection as well. And then all we can do is very clearly say this is information that comes from this and this source. Um, in this case, very often uh, Israeli military. And we cannot independently verify this. So I think we need to definitely make very clear where we get our information from and um, yeah, if we can or cannot verify this. Thank you so much. Stephen, how do you feel about reporting right now? <laughs> uh, I feel like the blind man trying to decide if it's an elephant or something else. Um, it's very difficult. I agree with everything Sophie said. I think she said it very well. We try very hard. Objectivity is in really the mind of the reader and the viewer. And I don't feel collective responsibility for journalism. I've long ago stopped feeling that. Um, having lived here and having spent a lot of time in Gaza in the past and in the West Bank and, and, and in Israel, I have a lot of friends on both sides. 
And I just try to stay cold about what I'm looking at, which takes, frankly, an emotional toll, I have to be honest with you. Um, I have joked with friends, it's not really a joke, I feel like a mortician here, um, describing a charnel house. Um, and there are a lot of passions on every side. Both sides are spinning as fast as they can. Um, verification is difficult, as Sophie said quite rightly, um, partly because of the um, attack on the Erez crossing, which is where we generally got into Gaza in the past. But I think because of a, of a political decision, the Israelis have not allowed Western journalists who were not already in Gaza to go in, nor have the Egyptians. The Egyptians have locked up Gaza as tight as Israel has done, which needs to be said. Um, so we are depending on people on the ground, very brave Gazans, some of them freelancers we've hired since, um, some wonderful photographers um, who are risking their lives every day. I mean, I, I don't want to sound banal about this. This is really, this is extraordinarily dangerous. Um, and um, I honor them and I admire them. And at least 40 Palestinian journalists have died already inside Gaza. Um, the West Bank is tense. So we're trying, we have a big team here. We have video people, we have fact checkers, we have internet checkers. Um, it's, it's, we have Arabic speakers and Hebrew speakers and so on and so on. But, you know, again, we're, we're, we're trying very hard to verify and we're trying very hard, though we seem to be kind of targets of both sides, you know, who are both unhappy or, I would say more than two sides. Everyone's unhappy with what we're doing, um, but we're trying our best to do it properly and to verify. I mean, are we succeeding all the time? Of course not, but but we haven't stopped trying. Thank you so much, uh, St Stephen. Um, and one of the also follow up question to you: um, the the speed of reporting, also because of the um, of social media channels um, and digitalization, has increased immensely so it's almost live coverage um, and live coverage makes it so much more difficult to um to well to verify the sources and um if if things are really to be interpreted in the way it is interpreted which can also then have political repercussions again and also repercussions on the conflict how are you um, and your newspaper dealing with this immense speed of reporting and also the the, um, um, by your readers, the wish to be informed on an almost minute basis. And uh, on the other side, the huge responsibility um, this comes uh, along with. Yeah, well, we, we are doing this blog on the war, which is like 24 seven, which is not the way newspapers used to work. I mean, I mean, when I joined the Times, we didn't have the internet and we didn't have the blogs. So it, it is pressure and, you know, I think a lot of people, including us, made a terrible error in the beginning on the Al Khali hospital, simply by attributing falsely, I think, uh, the explosion there to an Israeli attack, which it turns out it wasn't. Um, at the minute I saw the alert on that, I called our current bureau chief and said, oh no, oh no, I've been to this rodeo before. And it was a big blow. I mean, you know, and the Israelis jumped on it and the BBC did the same thing and CNN did the same thing. I'm sure ARD was much, much better at this than us. But, you know, it was a reminder to be careful. And, and I think we have been very careful. We don't put out videos. We haven't verified at all. We just don't. And we're not trying to compete with X, you know, or Instagram. I mean, there's a lot of disinformation out there. And as I say, there's quite a lot of spinning. And you see videos that are purportedly from Gaza that are actually from Syria and 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 so on. So, um, you know, it's easy to fake stuff these days. So again, you know, I'm not personally in the mid game of verifying, but we have people doing that. 
So we're trying. I mean, it's hard. You're right. I mean, and also the other thing is the size of the attack now. I mean, this is a war. It's not the past. And um, the size of the ground invasion, the strikes in Gaza, it makes it hard for anyone to keep up with what's going on. And clearly neither side wants us there looking at what's happening. Thank you very, very much, uh, Stephen, for sharing this with us. And I'm sure we come back to the issue of uh, disinformation or information manipulation um, in the war. Um, now, I would also love to hear from Pascal. Um, what, what is your view um, on current uh, reporting and how are you dealing with us being not on the ground, but being here in Berlin um, and uh, covering Germany on that topic? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, as you have said, I'm just I'm not on, on the ground, so it's a, it's a diff different position. I don't think uh, coming uh, back to your initial question, I don't think there is an objectivity uh, for journalists. You can try to present as many facts coming from as many perspectives as possible uh, to describe the reality. Uh, but it's very complicated in such a complex situation where you don't have white and black, every, you have 50 shades of gray, so to say. And uh, as Sophie mentioned, it's probably more complicated if you can't enter Gaza as a journalist. And I think also, uh, yeah, the, the backgrounds of the journalists, but I think also I see that uh, also between French and and what between what French and German outlets report, you see also the importance by a lot of um, colleagues and medias, uh, the importance of the background uh, of the the country has the history, of course, very important for for Germany. We will talk about it, and uh, that explains also. I think certain certain ways to cover uh, the situation. I think historically also, uh, and uh, I'm I'm pretty sure ARD also uh, ARD has probably covered the situation there since uh, how long five six weeks in a different way probably that than France 2, France two in 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 France yeah where uh, you have probably a more pro Arabic line so that's the situation I can I can see uh, but um, yeah for the for the moment that's all all I can see from 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 my little Berlin view so to say Mm, thank you so much. Um, but Pascal, also a follow up question on what you just said, which is very interesting, that you do see um, slight different weights um, in reporting according to country and according also to um, to uh, news outlets. Um, what how do you deal with this um if you are currently based in berlin you have been do you have been here for a long time um maybe you are feeling all, already a little bit german after such a long time <laughs> um and how do you deal with this if if the reporting um is slightly different in france with your own news outlet yeah i, I okay i have to cope with that i have to 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 know to integrate so to say I've, as somebody who has lived here for a long time what uh sometimes i have also to explain that to my colleagues i i notice clearly that uh, at least by radio front international in paris there is a uh, by a lot of colleagues a uh, 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 sympathy and empathy for the Palestinian cause and I am only underlining uh yeah the the the, the German specificity with these uh, terrible history and with the responsibility uh, here most of the politicians the government uh, express daily and of course you have people with another opinion but it's still uh, very, very important in that country. And uh, sometimes Paris has difficulties to understand uh, why it is, uh, why Germany has these more or less 100% solidarity with Israel. So that has also to be to be explained. But of course, uh, I report, I reported about, yeah, the, we will probably talk about that, about the increase of anti-Semitism uh, in the last weeks in Germany, like in the in a lot of countries, that's not unfortunately a specificity, but also of the importance, for example, about uh, uh, the importance of the of the ceremonies and the 
the speech is on the 9th of November, this very, very special day in German history. Thank you so much. And Sam, also the question to you, um, how do you feel about current reporting on the war and where do you see yourself? Um, hello, I'll just, before I answer, preface this for everyone who's listening, I might have to jump off because of the terrible building work which has begun this morning in the office next door to mine. So if, if things are interrupted, that's what's going on. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I mean, I think I, I share the same opinion as my colleagues. Um, I, I think it, it's it's an extremely difficult, uh, it's an extremely difficult uh, task to try and be objective. And I think one thing, you know, if, if one thinks one is objective, you're probably not. It's a bit like sort of, you know, the famous line, I forget who said it about quantum physics. If you think you've understood it, you don't. Um, and, um, you know, in this situation, um, clearly the, the emotional element to how people consume news uh, is is a huge part. And I think as, as journalists, you're schooled or, or you're you're brought up uh, as mainstream journalists anyway to, to try and report on and provide information as if it is a rational and, uh, you know, it is content devoid of emotion, but it's absolutely not. And I, I notice, you know, even um, with the kind of high level broadsheet uh, reporting of this news, um, that people's reactions to it, people's the way people um, read stories, and, and what they take from those stories is very different. And, and so there's an element with all of this conflict in which people are arriving to the news with a whole hinterland of, of, of priors, of, of assumptions, of prejudices, uh, of, of emotional triggers. Um, and, and it's not just something that's happened once, you know, as, as colleagues such as Steve, who've been reporting in the Middle East uh, for many, many years will know it's a, it's, it's a, it is a kind of repetitive element to this. And so people come at it with, with all of that baggage. Um, and, and that makes it very, very hard to report on. And, and here in Germany, I'm, I'm in Berlin as well, um, uh, like Pascal. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm at a remove from this, um, but I do notice the difference between obviously domestically how the, the information is consumed. And of course, then in comparison with other uh, countries in Europe, I, I recently a, a group of colleagues from Brussels were over here, journalists, uh, reporting for various uh, mediums um, and, and from across the EU and uh, and seeing their the questions they asked in in meetings with officials here in Germany were very interesting in and, and, and really highlighted the diversity of reporting positions that people were coming at this from. Um, and you had, you know, from from the kind of Irish perspective on the one hand that the, the you know a colleague from Ireland there was very, very um, critical of the German position, I would say, or, or couldn't understand it in her questioning right through to, to people from Germany um, who uh, had different questions, were much more interested in the impact of this conflict on uh, the kind of domestic extremism situation in Germany on the, on the, on, on, on the sort of Muslim community side. And, and there's the drilling. So maybe that's my cue to, 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 to shush now for a moment. It's really not that bad, Sam, and it already disappeared again. So it, it might it might get worse. So, so um, yeah. Anyway, um, but I think I, I think I finished my point. So thank you so much, and I come back to 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 you um, because in the next round, I would love to do with you is understanding Germany um, and the German position and how you explain that also to your colleagues um, outside of Germany. Um, but before I do so, I would also invite our participants. Um, you can um, already write uh, questions or comments into the Q&A function, um, and then I integrate this um, into our discussion. Um, I would like to start with Pascal Yu. Um, what would you say, in a nutshell, is the German position on this war, um, and how do you explain where it comes from to your colleagues uh, back in France? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I've already talked a little bit about that, uh, about the, the German specificity because of the, the, the responsibility if, of Germany, because of the Holocaust, of the killing of six million Jews uh, in Germany and uh, in Europe uh, during the Second World War. And without what happened here or what Germany uh, did under the Third Reich, there probably wouldn't be the state of Israel. And it is uh, it, that's ex that of course explained the the the, the, the historical responsibility, the political, the 
geopolitical uh, responsibility of Germany uh, since uh, the end of the 40s, uh, for uh, Israel and the solidarity of Germany towards uh, Israel. And um, I think that it, it has been said in some speeches uh, recently here, it is uh, a raison d'être, Staatsraison for, for Germany, but it also is one of the pillars of the post-war Germany. Uh, beside uh, Wirtschaftswunder and uh, and some other stuff, yeah. So and uh, and uh, the, the the close relationship with the U.S. etc. and later on with France, and uh, I think that's still very that's still a central element in uh, in the German identity in the German politic nowadays, and that's why we saw this. Yeah, big unity among uh, German politicians when the when uh, a declaration was adopted uh, through the Bundestag on the 9th of November. Uh, all of the members of the parliament voted for her for this declaration. Sorry, and uh, also AFD. Uh, although the right uh, this right wing party has also strong uh, anti Semitic positions. Uh, that's, for example, uh, uh, there's, 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 for example, a big difference with France, where we have a divided uh, political scene with the left, with the left wing party, especially uh, uh, not ac or not seeing or not, yeah, uh, not, not, not saying that Hamas is a terrorist group. So that's a big difference. And so that explains the this German specific specificity, which probably not only me but also all Germany correspondents sometimes have to to explain. Although it's because for us here it's uh, it's 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 like in 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 the German DNA, but sometimes it's not necessarily in twenty twenty three well understood. Maybe in other countries, and but we see that there are slowly. That's already what I what I've said. There are slowly. Uh, little um, uh, changes, of course, uh, since 1968 and uh, other post-colonial situations, you have also part of the of the uh, of the left leftist movements in in Germany uh, uh, supporting the Palestinians. So you don't have a I think that's different. You have also still a lot of people. I have a lot of friends supporting Israel because they are they feel responsible because of their of their history that's important but you see that uh, the situation is probably more complex there is a lack of empathy in Germany like in other countries with uh, Israel but especially with the Jewish community here in Germany and I think people are also the Jewish community suffering of that and you have of course that was not the case some decades ago, quite an important, that's uh, an important uh, uh, Palestinian or, or, or Arabic or Turkish uh, community in Germany, which also uh, explain not only uh, a lot of the, of the tensions we saw in the last weeks, the same in a lot of other countries, uh, Germany, uh, France and or the US. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Sam, you mentioned that you also have to explain to your colleagues um, or to uh, delegations of journalists who come here, the German position um, and the German mindset um, on the war, and that it is sometimes hard to understand for somebody who is not German or who lived in Germany. Um, how, how do you explain it? How do, how do you make it understandable? Well, I think as, <laughs> I think as Pascal uh, notes that that it's the weight of history that, uh, and it's 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 one of those issues where the present and the past, the tissue dividing them is very very thin, and um, for Germany, and I'm sure other countries might have similar issues in their past, um, but for Germany, that the the the, the kind of Vergangenheitsbewältigung, the, the overcoming the past, um, this is deeply bound up with that, and as Merkel said, and as Schultz repeated, it's and you know it, it's the it's the raison d'etat for for Germany that that. That uh, it, in in as much as you know the constitution bans Nazi extremism and and is explicit about anti-Semitism, it is also you know the, the comparison is drawn between protecting Israel. You know the the political class here has repeatedly said um, 
you know, Israel is our raison d'etat, Israel is, you know, the security of Israel is the security of, of Germany. But really, I think what they mean is not just that, it's the identity of Germany is, is bound up with, with the security of Israel. Not just, not just the state, but what it means to be a modern German is, is, is very much um, tied to the idea of supporting Israel. And even if that's not necessarily somebody every, something everyone thinks of here in the street, it is remarkable the level of cross-political support for, for that notion that exists. Um, and, you know, I think the, the timing of this conflict really, you know, was, was, you know, played on that in not deliberately, but just ended up being the case here because of the Kristallnacht, um, you know, as the memory on, on November the 9th. And, you know, in the run up to that, to have attacks on synagogues in Berlin was deeply shocking, I think, for, for, for people here. You know, a, a synagogue actually very close to where I live, just around the corner, was the one that was attacked with, with Molotov cocktails. Um, that is a deeply triggering notion. The notion of a synagogue, I mean, it didn't burn down, but, but the idea that in Berlin in 2023, you might have a synagogue being burnt down by people that hate Jews is, is, a, is, a, is a, I hate to use the word because it's such a cliche, but is triggering for people. Uh, and uh, and I think is is problematic, and 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 it's that you know it's it, it, I think in the understanding this conflict, as I said at the beginning, the understanding how history plays on individuals and individuals' understandings of history um, informs their their reading of this is is crucial, and, and just as would be absolutely the case in the Middle East, where um, you know people have very different perspectives on this depending on how they've experienced it through their families, through their you know childhoods, etc. Um, so here in Germany also, um, the kind of perspective on Israel in particular is informed by what people grew up understanding to be their responsibility and, and, and what it means to be anti-Semitic and have, you know, and, and tolerant and of, of, of cultures and things in, in Germany. Um, so I think it's, you know, that's, that's something that sometimes if you're just from the UK or, or maybe from France or wherever, you, you might not understand that, that element, the specific element uh, in, in Germany. And maybe also you kind of think, well, yes, I do understand that there was this thing in the past, um, but I think people don't necessarily understand how, how kind of low level and endemic that, that, that element penetrates into people's understanding of the situation here. Um, so yeah, I and mean, you know, and now it's interesting to see how it is. It is becoming politicized in the German, um, you know, in the in the kind of German domestic scene where you have the IFD even who, you know, on the one hand, you people might say, well, they're just Nazis, but on the other hand, they are clearly, you know, a lot of their kind of prejudice has been directed at Muslim immigrants in the last uh, twenty years, ten years or so. Uh, since they've been founded. So, um, you know, that, that, how that is playing out is interesting as well. Um, and that I think is going to be something that will be curious to watch. I noticed that the AfD tabled a, a resolution in the, in the Bundestag in parliament for, uh, for against imported anti-Semitism, uh, which is a, a very curious kind of rephrasing of this uh, problem um, to suit their political goals when, when they are also a party that uh, has the deepest and greatest um, number of anti-Semites supporting them. So um, yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sam. And we come back to um, our societal trends um, in the next round and if we need to be worried about Germany. Um, but I want to change the perspective now and uh, hear from Stephen and also from Sophie um, how Germany and our position and how we deal with the uh, war is uh, perceived in Israel um, and what your feeling is um, with regard to um, how we come across um, as a long partner of Israel, um, but also with everything what we just heard uh, Sam describing um, rising or uh, more visible anti-Semitism. Um, and I would like to start with you, Sophie. How are we perceived? How, how is this, how is Germany discussed? Well, I would say Germany is perceived as a strong partner, but we also have to be aware that in the end, the Germans are not that important. Um, I think we like to view ourselves as being an important player there, but it's the Americans. It's pretty much the Americans only, um, because what, what counts is military support, and that's coming from the US. I mean, Germans, the Germans gave two drones that were leased from Israel, they just stayed there. Um, and uh, there were talks about 
munition. Um, there hasn't been any confirmation that that munition was shipped. Might have been. Um, so uh, we shouldn't overestimate the importance of the Germans, but, but they were perceived, I would say, as a strong um, partner in solidarity with Israel. The fact that Scholz came as one of the first heads of state. Um, but it's also very interesting to look on the Palestinian side where um, German funds have been frozen um, for all Palestinian in institutions. Yes, there is still humanitarian aid, but that goes to international organizations. And um, there is a lot of, um, a lot of anger even, and um, a lot of loss of trust on the Palestinian side, um, the Germans were used to be um, considered a, um, a partner, a uh, trusted partner in the region, especially because Germany doesn't have these interests there, um, as the Americans do these geopolitical, geostrategic interests. We, the, the Germans don't have the colonial history of, of the French and the Brits. So they were considered to some extent as as credible partners, um, but at the moment, a lot of people, that's what, what we are hearing, um, are saying, well, you've, you've turned your back. Um, and um, the fact that Germany says it um, supports Israel um, no matter what, basically, um, is, is perceived with a lot of um, bewilderment, to put it mildly, um, on the Palestinian side. Um, I've experienced as a reporter um, that Palestinians didn't want to talk to me. Um, they were like, oh, you're German. Like, we don't want to talk to you anymore. And the fact that German funds have been um, frozen and they're all under review. This means, for instance, for all the German, we have these political um, foundations that um, do work um, in, in Israel. Um, and in and, and, and Palestine, and they support lots of local organizations. All of this has been frozen. All of this is under review. And there is now a situation that they say, well, then we're going to put you under review as well. Um, because there isn't, um, the, apparently the criteria aren't totally clear um, what this review constitutes, um, what, what it looks at. Is it supporting terror? What does terror mean? Um, is it um, accepting Israel as a state? Um, is it um, affiliation with BDS? What, what, what are the what are the criteria? Um, and when when is cooperation possible again? It, it puts a total halt on any sort of planning. And yeah, as I previously said, it also um, means that on the Palestinian side, people are retracting and are saying like, we don't want to work with you anymore. Um, and this uh, puts um, all the all these organizations that like German organizations that work in the in, in the West Bank and Gaza and into a difficult um, position. And they, they've told me we don't know how the future of our work in Palestine will look like. Um, and apparently there is a slogan going around: uh, "Free Palestine from German guilt." I've been hearing this a few times in the West Bank. And um, there is this perception that uh, Palestinians now need to pay for the mistakes, the, the massive mistakes uh, that Germany did in the past. And there is, yeah, a lot of anger, bewilderment, lack of understanding of what's going on, especially since Germany, on the one hand, is very much supporting the, the framework of international law and supporting its institutions. Um, but from the Palestinian point of view, this looks like a double standard not being applied to, to the West Bank and to, to Palestine. Thank you so much, uh, Sophie. And when you hear this, how do you react? <laughs> what do you well, say? Usually I tell them I'm not the German government. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm not making the policies. I'm not there to defend or, or, or you know, explain any of this because that's that's not my role I'm as a journalist and I, I tell them please differentiate between the German government 
and what we're doing on the ground. We're trying to report on what's happening. Um, we're, we're trying to get all the, all the different stories out. At, like it, It's been specifically in the West Bank that we've been facing this situation and we did stories about uh, uh, rising settler violence. We did story um, on uh, stories on uh, Gaza uh, workers from Gaza being stuck in the West Bank and and their stories. They're sometimes horrifying stories. Um, we did like lots of different kind of stories, but that's when we were facing this situation. And um, yeah, we're telling them it's. I can't answer this <laughs> because it's not my role. Mm. Thank you so much. Um, Stephen, um, do you share Sophie's um, observation? Well, <clears throat> I'm a German heritage, but I'm an American, so I don't have the same issue. But I, I must say this theme has been, I've heard it for 30 years. It's not a new theme, you know, about German guilt means that Germany is unobjective and and doesn't have room for Palestinian victimhood. At the same time, Germany is a huge contributor to UNRWA and to Palestinian aid and so on. So, I mean, people take rhetorical positions um, and on every which side. From, you know, when I have talked to people about this issue, I mean, Germany is probably Israel's third most important ally in the entire world. I would say the United States is first and Egypt is second, frankly, because without Egypt, there'd be a much bigger war. As you know, it's a quieter alliance, but it's really crucial. And um, even, you know, long time ago, talking to Yoshka Fischer about Israel, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's really important to Germany, it's important to Israel. And it is not completely without criticism. It, it isn't. I mean, it's not at all. The Israelis actually listen to German worries and complaints. Israel's feeling pretty lonely right now. Um, the EU is very split, which we all know. It's almost incapable of saying anything that's useful. Um, so, and it's not just about arms. I mean, it, it, it is about diplomatic support and, you know, quietly, you know, Israel is getting, I mean, no one in the Arab Sunni world wants Hamas to win, right? The Palestinian Authority doesn't want Hamas to win. Fatah doesn't want Hamas to win. Um, so you have a kind of very complicated set of interests, and yet, you know, the Arab street, which exists only in Western minds, but there's a lot of very unhappy Arab people who you know, whose own governments, even though they deal with Israel, have been pushing the Palestinian issue as a way to divert attention from their own failures for 40 years, 50 years now. So this all comes home to roost, but I I, I think the German position is really important um, to Israel, partly through the EU and partly through the UN and and, and partly through aid and, and help. Um, so, I wouldn't underestimate it, to be honest. I mean, you know, once in a while in Germany, partly because of the past, you know, you get a whiff of sanctimony about everything. But but the fact of the matter is people kind of discount that a little, a little bit. Um, and, you, you know, people looked at, let's say, the Habeck uh, statements um, with a lot of gratitude, frankly. You know, they may have been a little controversial in Germany. I'd like to hear about that. But certainly here they were welcomed as a very clear statement of what was at stake. Um, because frankly, from the Israeli point of view, the existence of Israel is at stake. This isn't a minor matter. I mean, Israel exists to be a safe homeland for its citizens, like most countries, let alone this other pretension Israel has to be a homeland for every Jew in the world, which is of course a slight absurd. Um, but the minute that is in question, um, you, you have a different argument. And Germany does support the existence of Israel and should support the existence of Israel. And that makes it different this time. I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Stephen. Sophie uh, mentioned that, that sometimes uh, we as Germany think it's all about us, um, but really on the ground, um, it's the United States, um, which is the most important partner. 
Um, Stephen, so could you tell us a little bit about the U.S. and the role of the U.S. and how that is perceived on the ground? Well, I'm brief, you, you know, I mean, Joe Biden has been deeply appreciated for his early support. You know, Ursula von der Leyen came too. People see her still as a German, I must say. Um, and Biden actually has been more supportive than Trump, which surprised the Israelis, um, but it comes with a cost. I mean, it, well, it comes with a price. I mean, and the price is the U.S.'s interests in the region too. The U.S. wants to help Israel, of course. The U.S. understands that um, this is a different order. This is a this is a war, not a not a mowing the grass, not an incident. Um, but at the same time, the U.S. has been crucial, crucial in pushing Israel toward allowing, and Egypt, by the way, because Al-Sisi hates Hamas, um, has been crucial to pushing aid into, into the Gaza Strip, not enough. The U.S. has been critical to these negotiations about uh, ceasefire, pause, hostage release, which I hope will happen today or tomorrow. In Qatar, I mean, Bill Burns has been negotiating. We've had special representatives. We've had Americans basically overlooking Israeli defense uh, plans and saying, oh, not this, don't it. Is warning Israel, Bibi at first talked about striking Hezbollah in Lebanon. And the Americans said, don't you dare, don't you do it. So it, it's, it's more than just emotional support. It, it is um, kind of trying to get this very right-wing, very vulnerable Israeli government, you know, in a country that's very divided anyway, to restrain itself and act in its own interests, even if it doesn't always recognize them. I mean, now, do the United States have a big plan for the future? Biden talks about, you know, a Gaza being run by a revitalized Palestinian authority, whatever that means, right? Nobody knows what it means, but talking, underlining the two-state solution, even if it seems like a fantasy. I mean, these are things the Israeli government doesn't necessarily like, but so it's a very important relationship, put it that way. It may not be a perfectly successful one, but it's a very important one. Thank you uh, so much. Before we come back to Germany and uh, take a look a little bit into the society um, and how the society reacts um, and if there are any discrepancies between the society um, and the government, which also Niklas Zimmer asked about um, in the Q&A, I would like to spend a few minutes on the geopolitical environment um, and uh, the war. Um, we know that we have lots of conflicts all over our planet. Um, we have Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the ongoing war. Um, we have in uncountable conflicts in Africa, um, which are more and more escalating. Um, and I don't need to uh, list all of these, but we know that the geopolitical environment has changed massively. And I wanted to um, start with you, Sophie, if you can observe um, the interests or attention other big players and powers um, are placing um, on the war. What is India uh, thinking and role? Um, or what is Russia's role and thinking? Do you perceive any Chinese influence or how is China reacting to this? I don't know if you can answer those questions because you're so deeply um, uh, involved um, on the ground, but do you, do you see the conflict, the war in a geopolitical environment or is that very much detached? What would you say? <laughs> Wow, I'm I'm not sure I can go in depth uh, in this um, because it's simply not my not too much of my focus. Um, these other big players, um, I mean, I'm I'm sure it does play a role. I mean, what we do see massively is the region. We see Qatar, of course. Like we see the massive influence of Qatar when it comes to the hostage negotiations, um, where they're constantly saying they're just about to reach a deal, um, which we're which we're waiting for. Um, and we, uh, I mean, there's in the past, actually even Germany played a role in this. Um, when we think back to um, Gilad Shalit, the, uh, the soldier 
the Israeli soldier that was kidnapped and uh, taken hostage to Gaza. Um, Germany played a role in this. I'm not so sure to what extent that's the case right now. It doesn't seem to be uh, really the case that, I mean, there are lots of German nationality hostages as well in Gaza, but, um, and the German government I think is trying, but I don't know to what extent they're actually reaching anything. Um, but but that that I find very interesting to see the the, the situation at the moment and to, and what impact also like with regards to former normalization efforts. I mean, this came this whole attack um, came uh, when there were talks about normalization with Saudi Arabia, and this uh, is totally off the table now. Um, and uh, so uh, in the I think it's very interesting with regards to to the Arab world and how they're involved um, and trying to mediate um, at the moment. No, thank you, thank you so much, um, Sophie. Um, Sam, do you see a geopolitical component to this uh, conflict? Um, yes, I mean, uh, for the, for the the points that Sophie has just raised, you know, the Qatari element is interesting. I mean, it's interesting in the German sense. That's I guess that's what what we're ultimately interested in in, in this particular discussion we're having, where you have had Erdogan here on Friday, and then obviously the Emir of Qatar was here only a few days after the attack. And of course, Germany's energy situation is bound up with gas deals that it's signed from Qatar. Um, Erdogan, hugely important for, for the migration problem that Germany is trying to deal with. So it's all of these things are interlinked. I mean, I, I think in, in a way, it's, it's always... Um, a bit of a cop out to think that there's geopolitics and there's domestic politics because clearly there isn't and this is a very good illustration of why there isn't right um but i think it's you know so we should also be aware that there, a, a greater catastrophe has been averted i mean i find that quite interesting you know that that um i think i think it was maybe in the new york times i read um the over the weekend or possibly a few days ago um a, a scoop about uh, how uh, the iranians had very clearly said um, to to Washington, you know, no, we don't want to escalate this. We do not want this conflict to spin uh, further out of control. Um, so I think that's an interesting element here. How how things have have fitted together there to to so far. I mean, who knows? We're only a month in, or so. But so far, contain uh, the conflict and, and stop a broader uh, regional uh, conflagration. Now, clearly, there are going to be second order effects from this, um, which will play out in the weeks and months and years to come. And one of the big questions uh, that I have not heard anyone answer um, on behalf of Israel, let alone the Israeli government, is what exactly their plan is. You know, you know, it was very interesting to, to hear, I think, Biden say, you know, don't let this be your 9-11. Don't make the same mistakes that we made in Afghanistan and Iraq in response to this. You know, fine, military intervention is definitely uh, needed on the table. Hamas cannot be left to, to exist as it does. But uh, consider what the long-term plan for destroying Hamas is, because, you know, 20% of it is a military campaign and the rest is, you know, how do you, how do you deal with the rest? And no one has really got that answer. Or I haven't heard it yet. Um, and I'm sure that's that's some of those conversations that, that Stephen um, highlighted that the US is going to be having with Israel. That is very much the nature of those. Um, so that, I think, is the, the big question in, in the next uh, few weeks and months. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, and we come to Pascal in a second. But Steve, Stephen, since um, Sam referred to you directly, let's jump to you. Um, and maybe you can pick up this point um, on the US. And I also want to throw a question, a couple of questions, actually, from the Q&A at you, um, which plays the war um, between Hamas and Israel um, and Russia's invasion of Ukraine into mm -hmm. context with each other. Um, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about if there is a context and a relationship um, or if there isn't. Um, I'll try to be brief because these are big, big topics. Um, um, in terms of the day after Israelis haven't a clue. I mean, they just want to seal off Gaza. I mean, I cannot believe, having spent a lot of time here, that they will um, subcontract their security along that border to anybody else. So my guess is in the darkest time, 
it'll be they'll treat it like West Bank area B, which means they go in and out whenever they want. Um, the question is whether they talk about taking a buffer zone, bigger buffer zone inside Gaza, that might include the Egyptian border too, which would seal it off. <clears throat> the Americans don't like that. Everybody says, no, 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 you can't have any reduction in land. Now, of course, officially there wouldn't be. Uh, the big question is what? where do all these poor people live? My God, right? I mean, who's gonna take care of them? I mean, they can live in a tent for three years. I mean, so, I mean, these are incredibly important you know, who will govern Gaza? Can the PA come back? If the PA comes back, it can't come back on an Israeli tank, so it has to be reformed. One assumes there'll be a new PA with new elections that may even include Hamas, because Hamas has probably earned a place now in the PA, and the PA won't have much credibility in Gaza without Hamas. But even if they come back, there'll be insurrections in Hamas. I mean, there'll be suicide bombers. I mean, you know, I mean, Hamas isn't going to disappear altogether. You have thousands of more people who are bereaved, who are angry, and 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 will want to do something. Hamas has always been very good at recruiting among the bereaved, um, and. Abu Mazen is like a tree without leaves in, on an empty plain. So something has to happen to revive the PA. And then, you know, will the Saudis be willing to pay? Blah, 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 blah. Who's going to, can it be like Kosovo? Can it be like a, a sort of UN condominium for a while? You know, while things are, who knows? Nobody really knows. But I can see, you know, this whole issue, this great American notion that you enlarge the problem. Well, if you enlarge the problem, then you could have a great big hostage negotiation where, you know, a lot of Palestinian prisoners are released mm -hmm. in a peace arrangement, including Marwan Barghouti, who's like the ghost in the machine. Um, tied to new negotiations on Gaza's future, tied to the form of two-state solution, tied to, tied to, tied to, who knows, right? But this is down the road. And then briefly, just on the other point, as horrible as this is, geopolitically, what happens in Ukraine matters more, in my humble view. And... Um, We've just seen in the last few days lots of visits to Ukraine, including by the American Secretary of Defense, um, reassuring the Ukrainians that support will be there. But obviously, we've reached peak Ukraine already in terms of support. It's not going to be more. And we're in a awful sort of stalemate that may not last through the spring. I mean, and we're talking about people moving in kilometers is this a big success, right? But don't rule out the possibility that Russians do a breakthrough in the spring. I mean, it, it's, it, it's a very difficult moment. And I know there are a lot of European governments, even the American government would like negotiations somehow, but I can't see why Putin wants negotiations. What's the point for him? You know, he wants to wait for the elections. So I, I don't think the two things are together, especially. I mean, regional interests are different in, in both cases. Um, there is concern about media attention and concern about leadership attention, that's for sure. But um, the last thing I would say is both these issues are hurting Joe Biden's political prospects quite seriously. Um, whatever you think of his policies, um, it's, it's, it's really... That part worries me too, just given the Trump possibility. Um, but we'll see. Um, we've got a, a year to go, and you know, a year is an awfully long time in politics. But um, it's it's been very difficult inside the Democratic Party, as it is inside the left everywhere. Um, what to feel about this conflict? what to do about it, um, et cetera. So I'll stop and Pascal, désolé. <laughs> <laughs> um, before I hand over to Pascal, um, and maybe you also want to say something on the geopolitics, I also want to bring us back um, to Germany and societies. And um, the German society, and not only the German one, I think, but 
most of our society seem to be at a somewhat vulnerable point um, and we are very susceptible to um, information manipulation. And um, we discussed that issue with some of the uh, bigger platforms, um, social media platforms here um, just a few days ago. And um, there is an increase of uh, misinformation, or actually information manipulation, um, both on the on Russia's invasion um, of Ukraine, certainly, but also on Israel and uh, Hamas. And um, the, the main sources of this uh, information manipulation comes from China and comes from Russia, not because they have necessarily a huge interest in the region, but their interest is to destabilize societies. And um, Pascal, um, as I said, maybe you want to say also something on the geopolitics, but maybe you can tell us also a little bit about ourselves um, and our society um, and why we are um, or maybe you don't share this, that we are actually vulnerable. Um, but what would you say is the current, yeah, how would you char characterize um, currently the German society? It's a big question, but I thought yeah. it nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, I already mentioned, so the, the, the huge solidarity among the, the German parties, among the German uh, politicians uh, for Israel, uh, that's one point. But at the same time, we also see in which complicated not for a moment talking about only about um uh, about the politics that uh, how difficult the situation of germany is uh, we already heard the criticisms against uh, germany in the region and uh, we see how difficult the, the german position is also sometimes in the european uh, union this traditional solidarity with israel but also uh, the importance of showing empathy uh, towards the the Palestinian uh, victims of the conflicts and underlining the necessity of humanitarian aid and Germany is traditionally that has already been mentioned uh, a, a, a big player in the region and wants to remain in that had also already has already increased is um, uh, is aid so uh, that's that's the one thing about what happens in german politics we see but but we see like in other western countries we see a divided society we see uh, and i think that could cause uh, big issues for the future because we have these on the one side, I already talked about it, the, the Jewish community, like in France, uh, which which has to struggle with the situation in Israel, with uh, the increase of anti-Semitic acts, and on the other hand, uh, miss misses some empathy from the German population. A friend of mine, she's a Jewish teacher, uh, the, the, the first day at school after the attacks, so it was Monday, the, the, October the 9th, no colleague told her anything about what happened two days before. Uh, and her plans to develop uh, yeah, some, uh, some, 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 some stuff at, at school about this topic was not supported through the school. Uh, on the other hand, you have also the Palestinian community here in Germany, the same, I think, in, in France, or probably in Great, maybe in Great Britain, it's different. Uh, they, are, they also have the impression they are not heard in Germany because of the history of this big solidarity. They have the impression they are persona non grata, uh, first uh, at the beginning, especially some demonstrations were forbidden. Uh, if you see the, the entire statistics, uh, that's not so so simple, but so and that could create that could create in the future more tensions in the German society. I think that yeah, this I could say the same for France, where we have the biggest Muslim community in Europe and the biggest Jewish community in Europe, and uh, so I think uh, yeah, so that that's the situation in in which we are, and uh, you have also. On a geopolitical point uh, point of view, we have also yeah Germany's role with this special position towards Israel, this very maybe uncomfortable position, <laughs> and uh, the necessity of uh, also 
being engaged for uh, humanitarian aid, but without calling for a ceasefire, uh, what Macron did. So uh, it's a very complicated situation. What will be uh, the, the position or what which, which standing will have Germany in the next years in the region because of this support? So a lot of questions are, uh, are probably coming up. Uh, in in Germany, in German society, but also for the, for German international politics. Pascal, do you mind if I ask you a, a brief question? Um, it's it may be an awkward one, and Sam Sam kind of referred to it, but the influx of non-Turkish Muslim refugees after two thousand and eight, um, with a, perhaps a very different view of of the conflict and the stakes and so on. I mean, how much of an impact has that had inside Germany in terms of the reaction to this war? If anyone wants to try to answer that, I know it's difficult. Yeah, I mean, you had already in, in Germany, especially in Berlin, I think that's the biggest Palestinian minority here in Germany, you had already a lot of uh, Palestinians, uh, a lot uh, move. I think forty thousand people who moved to Germany, especially in the in this already in the seventies after the the war uh, started in Lebanon. So and but of course uh, after the big uh, migration waves, uh, two thousand fourteen, fifteen, and in in the in the years after, you also have a new and or a bigger Arabic community in Berlin, uh, sorry, in Germany too, of course, um, which uh, the word has already been be used, which maybe strengthened the import of these uh, of these conflicts in the society. And uh, we have the same in France, as I as I mentioned, but in other countries. And that's why that's why also it's important, I think, but that's something which can only solve in a in a very long term perspective what what can be done. I think that that's an issue. I also already mentioned my friend that's already that's an that's an issue for the schools, for the politische Bildung, as they say in German. And uh, what do the the parties, uh, the political parties in in the landscape with which proposals? Um, uh, you have also the danger of this right wing party AFD. The same for the national rally in France, misusing the situation. And so, um, yeah, I think there are a lot. There are a lot of conflicts in the society which could become uh, bigger because the frustrations uh, which you mentioned among uh, Palestinians nowadays, which is unfortunately not uh, a very old one, will also increase here uh, in Germany or or in Europe. So, and um, with some. In the worst case, with some risks, uh, with uh, radical groups, or uh, we have these anti-Semitic attacks uh, increasing uh, all over Europe, I think. But uh, will it lead to more radical uh, uh, groups or violences? I don't know. I hope it won't be the case, but the danger exists. If I can just add to that as well, I mean, I think it is a a growing concern that the the 900,000 or so Syrian refugees in Germany who have left since 2014, since the, the terrible war there, um, that they their place in German society is um, from a kind of preventing extremism uh, point of view considered quite sensitive. Um, mainly as well because there's just no dialogue between the government and that community and you know unlike longer established uh, Muslim communities in Germany where there are civil society organizations and so on and so forth I think um, you know the the interior ministry here and the the domestic security agency here they worry greatly that uh, this is a group of people who have fled a barbarous conflict who have come to Germany who are um, shut out from the mainstream political discourse um, and who are now told that they are not allowed to um, to protest. Um, and, and that's how they feel anyway. 
Um, and I think they worry. Uh, I mean, this is, comes from conversations I've had with officials at the Interior Ministry, that they're very worried that this group is becoming much more radicalised very, very quickly, particularly the young people among them, and they are a mostly young demographic. Um, and they are very, very sensitive to this specific issue. Um, and, and the government, meanwhile, is finding itself in a very thorny patch um, of ground where it where it, you know, it has to it's considering criminalizing phrases like, you know, from uh, from the river to the sea, Palestine, uh, you know, shall be free or, or it, the, that is is now illegal in Germany. But but uh, how do you police that? For many people, many Palestinians, many Syrians, many many Muslims from the Middle East, that phrase is used generically in a in a kind of catch-all sense, and it doesn't necessarily for them, I don't think, imply what it might, which is you know the destruction and genocide of Israel, or perhaps it does, but they just haven't thought about it. But there's no there's no kind of reach out in Germany to explain to this community, okay, this is not appropriate to say this, or this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Um, and I, I know in a previous beat, I covered uh, terrorism in the UK and, you know, watched the government's years and years and years of wrangling and trying to get its terror strategy right. And what was always clear, although many mistakes were made and continue to be made, was that you cannot just have a sort of hard, this is the law and everything is illegal and nothing else, that you need a whole sort of spectrum of uh, efforts to talk to communities, to integrate them, to police um, where extremism is is on the rise and 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 to monitor it more carefully, um, and it's not just good enough to to sort of say here's the law and uh, and you're a terrorist now and you're going to jail because that way you will fail to prevent extremism uh, as much as you will encourage it. Thank you so so very much. Um, we are almost at the end, um, but I want to throw a. Um, last question at you um, for our last round. Um, as, a, as journalists, um, your job is not necessarily to give advice to the German government, um, but I still would like to ask you to do so um, from your perspective, um, either with regard to the relationship um, with Israel and uh, Palestine or with regard to um, our own societal trends. Um, and I would like to start with you, Sam, um, if you're invited to the chancellery. Um, what would you tell them? What should they do? Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure they've got a much better perspective on things than I do. <laughs> um, but um, if, if I was uh, to say one thing, I suppose it would be on the point I just raised where, where um, you know, I, I don't actually... Um, doubt that there is a, a genuine need for um, some kind of policing of, of this. I mean, the reality is there have been, you know, 2000, I think, anti-Semitic attacks in Germany, 50% of those in Berlin since the, um, sorry, that's anti-Semitic crimes in Germany, not necessarily attacks, but since um, October the 7th, it's a huge increase. There is a problem that that's, we, we need to recognize that that's the case, but I'm, I suppose my advice is, um, to think more carefully about how to respond to that problem and how to stop extremism uh, getting out of control. And that goes, of course, on the right as well, who are operationalizing uh, this problem. And, and, and actually, they are the greater political threat, ultimately. Um, so, you know, I, I would just say that there needs to be more community outreach, if there can be, uh, to a lot of these people who are very angry about this situation. Thank you so much. And over to Pascal. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, there are more needs uh, nowadays to um, to avoid a, a very polarized and society uh, and uh, devised society for political education. Uh, unfortunately, I think it has been changed now through the Bundestag, but uh, some cuttings were going on <laughs> paradoxically. And uh, yeah, that's very important. The schools are important, but maybe also on an international uh, perspective, maybe uh, Germany, of course, won't change. And that's uh, right uh, not to change its traditional solidarity towards Israel. But maybe there should be more. Uh, that's easier to say than to do. There should be uh, more efforts, uh, at least between. Uh, among the European states to uh, to reach for uh, a common perspective. Uh, you, the Europeans were divided in the last weeks. So that's not that's nothing very new. And uh, unfortunately, I I I 
I'm not always sure that uh, that uh, that Germany is doing enough to uh, to 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 with France and others uh, to enforce uh, Europe and to to allow Europe to have the European Union to have a common uh, a common uh, foreign policy and that's a big lag and we have uh, that was underlined already the big uh, key role of the United States but Europe uh, is. Uh, absolutely missing as it has been missing for a long time in these uh, region i think on a political point of view thank you so much pascal sophie sorry now i have some noise issue here <laughs> um uh, on a personal note i have to say it broke my heart when israeli friends who were considering leaving the country um, because of the situation with their families and were thinking of going to Germany, decided not to because they weren't sure if they were safe there. And that I found that horrible to hear that nowadays that's really a consideration not going to Germany because of the anti-Semitism going on there. Um, but uh, with regards to my five minutes with Scholz, <laughs> um, I would say, please define what the Staatsraison means and what the security of Israel means exactly. I remember when Netanyahu was visiting Berlin um, for the first time as the new um, uh, uh, prime minister and he and, and Scholz was asked if there are any conditions to this um, commitment, German commitment to Israel. And um, if basically saying, um, or, or if he upholds it, even if the judicial reforms were being passed and the nature of the state of Israel changes, and he said no. And um, I think there are many questions to be asked with regards to this phrase, um, what it means. Yeah, that's what I would like to know. Thank you very, very much. And with this, you answered also to a couple of questions in the Q&A um, who ask what the raison really means. Um, and uh, thank you so much for pointing that out, that that needs to be defined. Thank you so much, Sophie. And last but not least, Stephen. Well, the last thing you need is a foreigner telling Germany what to do. I, I know Schultz hates this. He hates this, but I would love to see him go on TV and give a speech explaining to Germans the stakes for Germany and the stakes for the existence of Israel and to talk about what's going on inside Germany. This is leadership and it's missing. And, you know, fine, but it's Habeck isn't the chancellor and Baerbach isn't the chancellor. And I, I would really love Tim to try to articulate Germany's position and what worries him about the current situation. And secondly, I would urge them to restore funding Im immediately to Palestinian NGOs that they trust, um, because there's no reason not to. Thank you very, Call very much. <laughs> Thank you very, very much to all of you. Stephen, you just said the last thing you need as a foreigner to tell you what to do. We love hearing from other voices and taking the other perspective. This is why we brought you together um, today to, um, to switch sides, to hear from different perspectives, from different views, um, and also to look at things from different eyes. Um, and so thank you very, very much for joining us this early in the morning. Um, this conversation has been recorded, um, so we will also share it among our networks and membership, but also on YouTube. Um, and um, thank you so much for taking the time. For Stephen and uh, Sophie, um, stay safe um, on the ground, um, and our hearts go out to you and your friends and your family, and um, we wish you a lot of resilience. Um, for the next uh, weeks. And uh, for Pascal and Sam, um, I heard that your, I hope that your warning voices will also be heard um, in the Chancery and in also in other ministries, because I agree, we do have to do a lot more with regard to our societies. And that's what Aspen Germany tries to do. So join us again. Um, thank you so much to our participants um, coming in um, this morning. Um, we 
it's almost the end of the year, but there are still some Espen events uh, coming up and we certainly hope to continue this conversation um, next year as well. Thank you so much, Stephen Erlanger. Thank you so much, uh, Pascal Thibault. Thank you so much, Sam Jones. And thank you very, very much, Sophie van der Tan. And I wish you a good day and to all of us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.